360. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. There's 10 chapters in this book. Um, really fascinating stuff, uh, for me anyway. I don't know. I'll try to make it as interesting as possible. Chapter 1. Uh, pharmacology of addiction. Uh, at present, there is a debate going on over the legalization of marijuana, both medical and recreational. About 30 states have legalized recreational marijuana, uh, which leaves 20 that uh, where it's Ill, uh, still illegal uh, to smoke pot. Currently, the drug that seems to be causing the most serious uh, problems is uh, crystal methamphetamines. We can argue about this if you like. Um, Prescription drugs, and we're going to talk about prescription drugs uh, on, on the next slide. Uh, they seem to be killing more people, uh, but doctors have stopped uh, prescribing so many uh, opiates. Uh, but crystal meth, of course, is an illegal drug. Not only are we having trouble with it in North America, but there, it's uh, causing a, a, a real problem in uh, Europe and Asia as well. And you can see what it does to people. Uh, it doesn't take very long for crystal meth to, uh, to age you very, very rapidly. Uh, most serious problem in the United States at present seems to be the use of prescription drugs, especially opiates and opioids. Uh, this is especially uh, a serious problem with teens. Uh, the biggest killer among all the addictions is the smoking of tobacco. States are increasing the limits to uh, of public smoking. Uh, the use of performance enhancing drugs in, in sports has been an issue since the home run race between Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa in 1999. It is accepted that steroids can cause damage, but new generations of performance enhance, enhancers have hit the, the sports scene uh, that do questionable damage and are undetectable through drug testing. Um, there has been an immense growth of computer games, cell phone usage, and other online problems, uh, especially pornography. Uh, with the increase of technology, psychologists have been behind the addiction power curve in uh, identifying problems that people are having. Early man saw his world as mysterious and dangerous, and they had a basic need to cope with his environment, and he had a basic need need to cope with his environment. Early man discovered that by ingesting certain plants, uh, they could ease their fear uh, and anxiety, uh, reduce pain, treat other illnesses, some illnesses, give them pleasure, and assist them uh, to talk with their gods. The human brain responds to psychoactive substances. When people suffer from mental illnesses or behavioral addictions, the altered state of consciousness makes the individual feel better. Psychoactive substances make the individual feel better. Otherwise, they wouldn't use them voluntarily. Governments, ruling classes, and religious entities have sought to control the supply of drugs through growing, uh, regulating growing, manufacturing, distributing, taxing, and uh, prohibition. Uh, ancient Sumerian medicine men used opium as a secret medicine. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt would dole out beer uh, to keep their labors build, uh, building pyramids. Sorry, had to kill fly. Coca leaves were controlled and doled out by the Incan rulers in Peru to maintain the, the needed laborers in the country that they controlled, in the area that they controlled. After the Spanish conquered the Inca, they controlled the growing of uh, coca leaves to increase tax revenues. The American revolutionaries exported and taxed whiskey and tobacco to help finance the revolution. Technology allowed addictive substances to change, improve, and strengthen potencies over the centuries. Alcohol was first distilled to heighten uh, the potency in Arabia in the 10th century. Morphine was first refined from opium in Germany in 1804. Cocaine was first refined from coca leaves in Germany in 1859. An automatic cigarette rolling machine was invented in the United States in 1881, bringing more tobacco uh, to, the, uh, to the masses. The stimulant amphetamine was first synthesized in Germany in 1887 to re replace ephedra. It was synthesized in Japan in 1919. 
interestingly, I guess, if you want to look at it that way, uh, both these countries used uh, uh, amphetamines uh, extensively during World War II, as did the United States and all the Allies. LSD was first synthesized in Switzerland in 1938 by this man right here. His name is Hoffman. Since the media growing techniques were first used in the United States to increase the THC level of marijuana in the 1960s, the THC content of marijuana is 14 times stronger today than it was in the 1970s, making uh, the old debates uh, kind of ridiculous because uh, the pot of your uh, of your grandparents isn't anything like the pot of, of uh, that uh, you can find on the streets today. Uh, 14 times is a lot stronger. The amphetamine molecule was first modified to produce designer drugs such as MDMA in the United States in 1910. Faster and more efficient methods of putting drugs into the body has introduced the effects, has intensified the effects, sorry. 4,000 BC, Sumerians mixed opium with alcohol to produce a stronger effect, and it worked. It was discovered that absorb the absorptive effects of coca leaves could be intensified if the leaf was mixed with charred oyster shells in Peru in 1450. In England in 1800, aficionados discovered that they uh, felt giddy and high from inhaling nitrous oxide. Laughing gas. <laughs> 1900 Europeans discovered that if they snorted cocaine, they would absorb the drug more quickly. In the United States, users discovered that they could intensify the high of crack cocaine by smoking the rocks in 1970s. Within the last decade, users have discovered that they could get a bigger rush from select time-release pain relievers, oxycontin and hydrocodone, by crushing the tablets and injecting them directly into the bloodstream. Over 4,000 plants have been identified as yielding psychoactive substances. 60 of these have been in continuous use somewhere in the world throughout history. Opium poppies, marijuana tops, coca leaves, tea leaves, beetle nuts, cot leaves, coffee beans, tobacco leaves, Fruits and other plants that can be used to manufacture alcohol, and we're going to talk about all of these eventually. There is evidence that select groups of Neanderthal and Europe used fly agaric mushrooms to produce hallucinogenic effects for shamanistic rituals. And this is theoretically what uh, um, Neanderthals look like. Uh, evidently, they had big noses or wide noses. Many of the first cultures uh, considered alcohol, uh, alcoholic beverages, especially wine, as a gift from the gods. Uh, the god that gave us alcohol in Egypt was Osiris. Uh, the, the god that gave us uh, alcohol, uh, wine uh, to the Greeks was Dionysus. And uh, the god that gave the Romans their wine was Bacchus. The Bible has 150 references to alcohol. Most of them are warnings against its use. Opium has been cultivated in the civilized world for over 6,000 years. In ancient Egypt, 5,000 years ago, opium was used to treat mental illness and to quiet crying babies. Cannabis sativa has been grown as hemp for thousands of years. The plant has been used mainly for its fiber in manufacturing rope but also for its medicinal and hallucinogenic properties. But this was mostly in Asia. Mescal beans, peyote, cacti, and uh, psychedelic mushrooms have been used for their hallucinogenic properties for thousands of years. Mostly used by shaman for visions, these drugs have been used in both North and South America. The psilocyba mushroom has, was preferred by the Aztecs and Mayan cultures. Uh, of the 3,000 species of mushrooms in North America and North and South America, only 80 produce hallucinogens, uh, psilocybin, and psilocin. Out of 30,000, 80 produce those two hallucinogens. Tobacco cultivation and use dates back 7,000 years in North America. Looking at the substance uh, from a survival point of view, its strong alkaloid properties not only made it noxious to herbivores, 
uh, but gave it the uh, properties that humans seek. Uh, and it is these alkaloid properties that makes it so destructive. And that's what the problem is. Archaeological evidence from South America shows that coca leaves have been prized by indigenous people there for at least 5,000 years. Evidence seems to indicate that they gave it uh, to the dying to ease their journey into the afterlife. Other drugs used by ancients include members of the nightshade family, uh, sol solenicae, uh, which contain the chemicals atropine and scopolamine. During the Middle Ages, people used these drugs were accused of witchcraft, the medicinal qualities being ascribed to demonic possession or collusion. Uh, there is um, evidence that witches would ride uh, uh, witch brooms, or they would ride on brooms, broomsticks, uh, and the broomsticks were made out of uh, these uh, nightshade, sticks from the nightshade family. And they, uh, of course, they were not wearing any underwear and uh, that's how the uh, the atropine and scopolamine got into their system through their nether regions as they were riding along on their broomsticks. Datura, also known as thorn apple, is sometimes made into a salve and absorbed through the skin. Uh, we've got this, I've got this stuff in my yard. I was just pulling some out today. <clears throat> Hinbane has been used uh, as far back as ancient Egypt, 3,500 uh, 3, years ago. It was used as a painkiller and a poison. In ceremonies, it was used to induce insanity, which in turn produced hallucinations that resulted in prophecies. And that's Hinbane. Uh, Belladonna, which is uh, Italian for beautiful woman, is also known as witch's berry and devil's herb. Uh, this... Uh, Drug dilates the pupils, it inebriates the user, uh, and it can be and it can cause hallucinations and delirium. You may know this plant as the amaryllis. It, the that is actually belladonna, but amaryllis is the common name for the flower. <clears throat> the mandrake is also known as mand mandragoria, mandragora. The root of the plant often grows in the shape of a man and uh, was used in ancient e uh, Greece to make uh, prophecies. The drug causes hallucinations and delirium. In 15th century Italy, it was used as an aphrodisiac. And this is what the plant looks like. Mandragoria. Mandragora. One of the stranger psychoactive drugs is ergot, a brownish purple fungus uh, that causes cereal grain rust, especially on rye, but also on wheat, barley, and triticale. The active ingredient in ergot uh, that causes the problem is lysergic acid diethylamide, also known as LSD. Outbreaks of ergot in uh, Europe and rye growing areas have caused widespread insanity and death. One outbreak in France in 944 is reputed to have killed 40,000 people. And that's what wheat rust looks like or barley rust. Um, it also grows on triticale. Uh, you guys probably never heard of triticale, but uh, in the 70s, they were thinking of replacing uh, wheat with triticale. Uh, triticale has a different, a little bit of a different flavor. It's got a nuttier flavor, and, for, and it uh, makes a, uh, let's see, what was the problem? Uh, the problem was that it made a, um, uh, a, a tougher bread. Uh, so you could buy triticale bread. Uh, back then. Triticale has a larger head than wheat does, and uh, so it looked like that might solve the world's uh, food, food shortage, but uh, but people didn't like it as much, especially in the United States. It's grown, it's grown uh, around the world uh, by people who are smarter than people in the United States. I don't like it. Tastes too nutty, you know, that kind of stupid stuff. So I remember in the 70s when they were, when they were, they were trying to, to uh, uh, they were talking about replacing wheat with triticale in the United States. And I was living in Lubbock, Texas at the time. I was stationed in Lubbock, Texas at the time. And the field right behind uh, our house, we lived on base, but uh, the, uh, we lived right on the, uh, the edge of the base. 
And uh, the field right behind us had triticale. And I was amazed because, you know, I grew up with wheat. <laughs> Uh, my family were wheat and soybean farmers, and uh, I was amazed because the heads were twice as big, and I couldn't see, I, you know, I couldn't see any reason as to why you couldn't replace wheat with triticale. Uh, the first written use of caffeine uh, came with the Olmecs in 3,500 uh, years ago, who used coca or chocolate to produce a stimulating but bitter drink. Tea was cultivated 1,700 years ago in China and is, has been used in Eastern Asia ever since. Coffee was first cultivated about 1,200 years ago in Arabia. The invasion of the Americas by the Europeans opened up new markets for psychoactive substances as the European and American people traded their addictive substance, substances back and forth. Coffee, alcohol, and tea were brought to the Americas and coca and tobacco was taken back to Europe. Ritualized use of the stimulants became part of each culture. Opium came back to Europe in the form of a medication known as Theriac, which uh, saw opium mixed with from 70 to 100 other medications. Eventually in the 16th century, a stronger version of opium began to be used as a tincture of opium became quite popular, a substance known as laudanum, was used for everything from a sleep inducer to a painkiller to a treatment for alcoholism. And uh, a famous poet, uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, was, uh, was using laudanum, or used laudanum, trying to get rid of his uh, alcohol addiction when he died. In early 1600s, a new drink was invented in Holland. It was called gin. Uh, because of the contamination of the water supply of Europe, only alcoholic beverages could be drunk with impunity. This new drink uh, was fl flavorful, easy to make, and inexpensive. It became the drink of choice among the poor in England. Uh, something's happening right now in, uh, in Europe. Uh, they're in drought. They have, have never seen drought quite this extreme before. Um, the, they use the rivers as sewers uh, in Europe, and they've been using their rivers as sewers for thousands of years. Uh, for that reason, there's you can't drink the water in uh, in Europe, uh, which is was a bit of a shock uh, for people stationed in Germany or or England or wherever they were. Um, you drink something else. You can't, <laughs> and uh, the safest thing to drink is something with alcohol in it because it. Uh, uh, it sterilizes whatever it is that you're drinking. So alcohol became uh, came, became very popular, and uh, uh, since you couldn't drink the water, uh, you didn't have much choice. I guess you could drink the rainwater, but that was about it. The river water certainly you couldn't drink. Uh, the the rivers in England or in, uh, in Europe are drying up. Um, they are they have um, uh, forest fires going on all over the place. A uh, real serious problem right now, right this second, as we speak, as I speak to you. Uh, so they are rediscovering their, their old sins. One of them is that uh, the riverbeds stink. Uh, why do they stink? Because they've been using it. They, they, they are, in essence, sewers. Uh, when it has a lot of running water in it, you don't. it's not as bad. But as that water dries up and becomes dirt, or become sand or whatever it is on the on the bottom, some kind of loam. You can smell the human waste products in the in the soil. Okay, so what do we have? We're, we've got gin. This is the 1600s. Uh, gin is the most popular drink uh, all over Europe, but especially in England. Quickly, alcoholism rates and mortality due to drinking skyrocketed in, in the back uh, alleys of London. Uh, England's growing population stopped growing due to the deaths. Um, attempts to regulate gin production and distribution led to riots in the streets. Production rates septupled. Septupled means it was multiplied by seven. Finally, in 1751, new laws were passed and gin consumption returned to less deadly levels. And, of course, this is a picture of some of the horrible things that were going on at the time. Here's a baby that's falling out of his mother's arms. And, of course, he will crash onto the ground. 
Here's a man that's starving himself to death by drinking. Um, and people made a lot of money. The Brits are big on, on making money. This guy's hung himself. Uh, they're, they're dunking somebody in the... Oh, no, they're carrying people around in, in a wheelbarrow. Uh, anyway, a lot of crazy stuff. A lot of anger. Riots in the streets. Okay. Population, to the extent that the population actually stopped growing in, in, uh, in uh, England. Still, control of psychoactive drug use was sporadic throughout the world. Nitrous oxide inhaling parties were not uncommon in Victorian England, though the practice sometimes resulted in more fighting than laughing. And of course, it's nitrous oxide is laughing gas, and people are trying to have a good time. And it doesn't always lead to feeling feeling uh, funny. Sometimes it leads to just feeling angry. Morphine was about 10 times as potent as opium. Morphine was used during the Crimean War, which was in the 1850s, and then the American Civil War uh, to treat wounded casualties. Uh, the American Civil War was in the 1860s, 1861 through 1865. Many men became addicted to the painkillers after these wars. Uh, this was the Crimean War in England, uh, between England and several allies against the Russians. And the English won the war and took over Crimea. Opium became dangerous to life and limb with the development of morphine, but it uh, would get worse. In 1855, the hypodermic needle was invented, making it possible to inject morphine. In 1873, or 1874, excuse me, morphine was synthesized into diacetyl morphine or heroin. Heroin, heroin uh, was two and sometimes five times stronger than morphine. So we started out with opium, uh, then we uh, developed morphine, which is five times stronger than, uh, than opium, and now we have heroin, which is two to five times stronger than morphine which makes it, what, 25 times stronger than opium? Opium became uh, involved in one of the oddest events in the history of psychoactive substances. The British were addicted to the caffeine and tea, but the Chinese demanded silver bullion uh, to buy it. Bullion. Uh, <laughs> I guess <laughs> I'm probably pronouncing that word incorrectly. The British had uh, no commodity. I, I'm not talking about... <laughs> making soup. I'm talking about uh, solid silver is what I'm talking about. The British had no commodity that the Chinese wanted, that the Chinese would buy with silver. The Chinese had eradicated opium smoking from their country in about 1000 AD. So they hadn't had it for about 800 years. In 1839, uh, the British battled the Chinese to open their ports to opium trade. The Chinese lost the war in 1842. It took them three years to defeat, defeat the Chinese, but at least they got the Chinese to take opium in trade for tea. Actually, they got the uh, Chinese to trade uh, opium for silver, and then they traded the silver for tea. And this is one of the reasons why the British had so much tea. A second opium war was fought from 1856 to 1860 to open more Chinese markets for trade. The Chinese lost again. Uh, trade went from 15 tons in 1800 to 2.5 million tons by the turn of the 20th century. The British had cheap tea and the Chinese had an addiction uh, that still goes on today, by the way. In 1859, cocaine was synthesized from the coca leaf. It quickly became a new medicine. It was used as a topical anesthetic uh, and used for eye surgery. It was mixed with wine to make a new, stronger concoction. It was used by Freud to control asthma, gastric problems as an aphrodisiac, and to relieve depression. During the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, many patented me medicines were manufactured with what would become illegal drugs. Coca-Cola was first manufactured with five milligrams of cocaine and contain, continues to contain coca extract with the uh, cocaine removed. Uh, Coca-Cola continues to use the largest purchase, uh, they are the largest purchaser of Trujillo coca leaf. 
Um, now, look, of course, uh, they've replaced it with uh, caffeine. They have caffeine that, that gives you your buzz. Uh, but it, the flavor of Coca-Cola uh, comes from uh, cocaine or from the coca leaf, coca extract. I used to think it was, uh, uh, what is that stuff? Uh, I can taste it in there. I can taste it. Coca-Cola tastes different from Pepsi-Cola, from any other colas, uh, and I could taste the difference. And I thought it was a different flavor, but it turns out to be coca. So there you go. I was wrong. It was uh, it was coca leaf, coca extract. While all was not paradise in alcohol-soaked United States, drunk and high men made uh, poor workers and worse husbands. Inebriation impeded responsibility and abuse among drinkers was common. The first temperance organization was started in the United States in 1826. To understand why temperance was so widely accepted in the United States, we have to understand the woman's lot in the early 19th century. Contraception was illegal in the United States. It was illegal in the United States because of the Comstock laws. So women tended to be pregnant almost constantly. The drinking uh, patterns in the United States followed the path of cheapest booze. Corn liquor was least expensive, so men tended to drink voluminous amounts of whiskey. Women saddled with a sporting husband were likely to raise her children in poverty and have to accept his drunken abuse. U.S. consumption of alcohol in 1830 was 7.1 gallons of pure alcohol for each citizen compared to 1.8 gallons today. Uh, so what is what are we talking about? 7.1 gallons. 7.1 gallons of pure alcohol is 200 proof. Uh, most of your drinks, uh, most of your hard liquors that you drink today <clears throat> is uh, 100, 100, maybe 120 proof. Uh, some of your strongest, stronger liquors, vodka, for example. Uh, most of your whiskeys are in the 80 to 120 uh, proof range. Uh, so what, what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, about 14 gallons of, uh, of whiskey. That's what we're talking about. Uh, or 14 gallons of vodka. Or 14 gallons of tequila. 14 gallons. And gallons are those jugs that you carry around your milk in. Uh, so 14 of those, that's how much you would drink a year. That means you were drinking more than one of those every month. And that was the average consumption for each citizen. That's not everybody. Today, um, the average U.S. citizen only drinks 1.8 gallons, which is still a lot of booze, but it's not nearly as much. It's, uh, it's one-fifth the amount that they used to drink. Okay, so a lot of alcohol was being, uh, was being consumed. Uh, a lot of men were staying drunk almost all the time. Uh, and, of course, they made very poor workers. They also made very poor husbands. The first state to prohibit the sale of alcohol was Maine in 1851. By 1855, one-third of the states in the United States had laws controlling the sale and use of alcohol. Now, we're talking about prohibition here. Okay, so a third of the states... Uh, in 1855. By 1920, enough states limited the use of alcohol to lead to the, the passage of the Volstead Act, prohibiting the manufacture or sale of alcohol. But alcohol wasn't the, the first psychoactive substance regulated. In 1909, the Opium Exclusion Act was passed, banning the, uh, the importation of opium into the United States for use other than medicine. Now, the reality was that there weren't a lot of uh, people in the United States that were using opium. Uh, most of the people using opium were uh, Chinese immigrants coming into the United States. They had developed the habit overseas. So one of the reasons that they passed the Opium Exclusion Act was to, uh, to keep it from uh, be becoming an addictive substances with the general population in the United States. It was also used to um, combat uh, Chinese immigration. Uh, they were afraid of the yellow peril, uh, so they were trying to keep uh, Chinese people out of the United States. As a matter of fact, in 1889, they passed the, uh, what did they call it? The uh, Asian Exclusion Act, uh, where they... Uh, 
wouldn't allow uh, people from Asia to immigrate to the United States. Uh, that wasn't just the Chinese, it was also the Japanese and Koreans as well. And these laws didn't change. They, they were passed in the 1880s. These laws didn't change until after World War II. It's one of the reasons the Japanese were so upset with us during World War II. In 1914, the Harrison Narcotic Act was passed, labeling opium as a narcotic to be controlled by the federal government. <clears throat> While the Volstead Act was repealed in 1933, other uh, psychoactive substances have been added to the list of controlled substances in the United States. 1937, the Ta Marijuana Tax Act was passed, banning the use of cultivation of cannabis. Um, there was a movement in California to, to get cannabis um, uh, made illegal as a drug. Uh, why in the world did they do that? They were trying to control uh, uh, Mexican immigration at the time. Um, the rest of the United States didn't really care because, well, they, they didn't have, there wasn't as much immigration coming into the rest of the United States. Only California was inundated with, uh, with Mexican immigration. <clears throat> In Texas, uh, New Mexico, and Arizona, uh, it wasn't that important. Uh, but there was uh, Ralph Randolph Hearst, the newspaper magnet, uh, for some reason, didn't like Mexicans, and he was trying to keep them out of the United States. Um, the rest of the United States, Texas, um, uh, that shared a border with Mexico, Texas, New Mexico, and uh, Arizona, uh, they had open borders pr primarily. So people were just kind of wandering back, back and cross, across, back and cross, back across. Uh, anyway, they were come, going back and forth. 1965, drug abuse control amendments regulated the manufacture of stimulants and depressants. Uh, cloves. Cloves was the flavor I was trying to think of. <laughs> I thought, I thought Coca-Cola had cloves in it, but it's not. It's, uh, uh, it's co coca extract is the flavor. 1965, drug abuse control amendments regulated the manufacture of stimulants and depressants. In 1970, the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act consolidated all the drug legislation, leg, legislation so that they would be controlled out of the same office. In 1984, the legal drinking age was raised to 21. Uh, who was president in 1984? Uh, 1984, the president was Ronald Reagan. Yeah. He was president from 80 through 88. Uh, so did the Volstead Act work? That's a question that people ask themselves. A lot of, uh, if you watch cop shows, you'd say, oh, the Volstead Act didn't work. Uh, all these, uh, all this violent crime and whatnot. The answer really all depends on who is answering it. Good things uh, that trans uh, pired, transpired from prohibition uh, if you if you watch the cop shows, you think, hey, this stuff didn't work. Look at all the problems we had during uh, Prohibition. Uh, if you're a medical person, you're going, you know, maybe it wasn't so bad. Uh, also, if you look at the statistics, wow, uh, things really changed a lot in the United States. Uh, so if you're a medical person, cirrhosis of the liver and other uh, alcohol-related diseases declined dramatically. Domestic violence fell, so if you're a social worker and you're looking at those statistics, you're saying, wow, it really worked. Uh, violent crime actually fell by two-thirds, so if you were a uh, police, uh, uh, if you were in law enforcement and you looked at the statistics, you'd probably say that was a good thing. Uh, probably public drunkenness disappeared, and if you were a social worker, if you were a, uh, a policeman you were pro or a law in law enforcement, you'd probably say, goody, this looks really good. So what are the statistics that, that don't look so good? Uh, what negative things transpired that were directly related to the Volstead Act? It increased organized crime. And of course, the FBI became came into its own during, uh, uh, during the, uh, during prohibition. And for this reason, because of uh, J. Edgar Hoover uh, wanting uh, the FBI to be the, na the national uh, police force, um, for that reason, uh, he, he said that prohibition didn't work, and he's the one that changed everything. 
Uh, corruption of politicians, uh, once again, uh, the, the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Corruption of law enforcement personnel, once again, the FBI. Uh, drinking eventually returned to pre-prohibition levels, but it took 20 years. And since the population had markedly increased, the amount of alcohol consumed was actually lower per person. And I think I can get this information for you. The booziest places on earth. Um, and there you go. The darker it is, the, uh, the boozier it is. Europe and Russia, um, they, they consume a lot more alcohol. This is Argentina, this country here. Australia consumes a lot of alcohol. United States, uh, not so much. But we're kind of boring. Brazil, not so much. South Africa, not so much. That is Nigeria, I believe. This purple one right here. So Europe, lots and lots of booze. Yeah. Yeah. Oops, what's that? Distribution of most consumed alcohol beverages, liters of alcohol. So who makes all of it? Uh, United States and South America make a lot of it. A lot of booze, not so much. Oh, they make, this is vodka. This is where vodka comes from. The United States is beer. <clears throat> Strangely enough, all the beer companies in the United States, almost all the beer companies, all the big ones anyway, Budweiser, for example, are owned by a company in Belgium. And that's Belgium right there. Yeah, okay. Boozy's place is on earth. What's wrong with pot? Uh, hemp was grown in the Americas uh, with little problem until it uh, first began to be smoked as a mild hallucinogen in Texas in 1910, from whence it spread to the rest of the West. Uh, so really, no, nobody in the East really cared about marijuana. They'd never heard of it. They'd never seen it before. Uh, in the 1930s, the Hearst newspapers ran a propaganda campaign to label marijuana as a narcotic. Part of the complaint with marijuana was that it was being brought to the United States, uh, into the United States by Mexicans, so it was a way to control the illegal entry of that population. That was especially in California, not so much anywhere else. So because California didn't want Mexicans and uh, marijuana to come into the United States, they had a, uh, that's where it was, it became illegal uh, for the whole United States. By, the, the by 1936, uh, 38 states had branded marijuana as one of the most dangerous of drugs. In 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act was passed banning the growth of marijuana in the United States. Marijuana was used as a drug only in rural areas where it grew wild and in the back rooms of cities where it was identified with jazz musicians and beat poets. And the reason I have this picture is because these are the, these are the beat poets. Uh, the only person I really uh, recognize is Allen Ginsberg. And I've actually met this guy. Well, he's dead now, but uh, I actually met these guys. All the people around, this is uh, Burroughs. I have a book. He's the, I, he wrote a drug-fueled book. Once upon a time, one of these guys is uh, is Jack Kerouac. I think this is Jack Kerouac right here. Anyway, strange, strange stuff. These are the beat poets. In 1950s and 1960s, the influence of the beat poets' support of using psychoactive substances, including marijuana, as an act of rebellion, caught on with the youth of that era. Uh, these people became the beatniks. They were uh, they were fueled by the beat poetry. Uh, they'd sit around and, and, and quote this poetry. I've got, I've got Allen Ginsberg around here someplace. <clears throat> Remember, I was an English major <laughs> when I was at Wabash. And that's where I met Allen Ginsberg. He came uh, for a poetry reading. And I was working in the uh, cafeteria. And he came through and he asked me what I was going to do. And I said, well, maybe I'll go into advertising. He said, don't do that. Go into advertising or teaching. He said, don't, don't go into advertising. Those people are uh, parasites. That's what he said. Call them parasites. Go into teaching. And, of course, I did go into teaching, but it didn't have anything to do with, with Allen Ginsberg. Uh, that was in 1967, I think. Uh, by 1971, I was in the military, so that's not what he wanted either. Uh, with the beginning of the Vietnam War, the anti-war movement became an, an intermingled with youth rebellion 
which by this time was connected to the marijuana usage. And of course, marijuana usage uh, peaked after the war uh, in the late 1970s. That's when uh, more people were smoking pot. Uh, by that time, of course, I was still in the military at that time. I was also a narc. Um, one of my jobs was uh, collecting drug, um, drug uh, urinalyses uh, for testing. Uh, makes me a narc. Amphetamines were first synthesized in 1887 in Germany. Over the years, the substance was used as an inhaler under the name uh, benzedrine and as an appetite suppressant. During World War II, amphetamines were used to combat fatigue by both sides. My dad was given, my dad was driving before he joined the army in 1942. Um, he drove ammunition trucks from uh, northern Indiana to southern Indiana. <clears throat> and uh, so they had the circuit that they had, had to, to make, and they had to make, I don't know, two or three trips a day. Uh, so a lot of it was taking a, a little bit longer because the roads were so clogged up. Uh, so they tried to keep them awake by giving them um, amphetamines. But my dad, dad never took them. Uh, he said he had access to them, but he never actually took them. Um, and he drank uh, caffeine instead, which actually doesn't work on him, but he was able to stay awake. Uh, what else happened? Oh, during the war, uh, he, they were offered uh, amphetamines, but uh, he never, used, never ne felt like he needed to use it. Uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, amphetamines were used uh, in diet pills. Uh, by 1970, it was estimated that 6 to 8 percent of Americans were using diet pills. Amphetamines were part of the fuel of the hippie movements and the summer of love in 1967. That's the year I graduated from high school. Congress passed the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970. The summer of love was primarily on the, on the coasts. And I was from Indiana, right in the middle of the, the country. Uh, so, uh, you know, the summer of love, we miss, pre we miss that a lot <laughs> because we missed it because we were living in the middle of the country. We were pretty naive at that time. Anyway, as much fun as that is. Sports were pretty much the purview of the wealthy and the extremely gifted through the first half of the 20th century. It wasn't important enough to try to cheat or gain an advantage. This is Johnny Weissmiller, uh, who eventually became Tarzan. He was an Olympic gold medalist. With the Cold War after World War II, every field uh, where the free world met the communist world became a battlefield of sorts. Uh, the world of sports, especially the Olympics, became a very contentious area of conflict. Eastern Bloc countries, led by the example of East Germany, began uh, giving their athletes anabolic steroids, creating super athletes. The world was appalled by the results and came out against the practice in 1968. Since then, all amateur athletic organizations have banned the use of steroids, along with uh, the professional athletic organizations around the world. Uh, this is a young lady, uh, East German young lady. This is what he looks like today. He has become transgender. They gave him so, many, so much anabolic steroids that it, it made him masculine. And because of that and because it readjusted his brain, he decided to become a male. And there he is today with his mustache. And there he is in the old days. You can see the resemblance between the two of them. This is when he was a woman shot putter, female shot putter. And now he is a guy. Sedatives have been used since the beginning of the 20th century in the form of bromides, chloral hydrate, and peraldehyde. Barbital was marketed in uh, as Veranol in 1903. Uh, phenobarbital was developed in 1913. And these were used as sleep aids primarily. Sedatives became very popular during the Depression and World War II eras, peaking in this time period with over 50 different barbiturates dominating the market. In the 1950s, doctors realized that they had not only overprescribed the drugs, but they had created a whole generation of addicted adults. In the 1950s and 1960s, a whole group of milder tranquilizers were developed to replace the more dangerous tranquilizers. Milltown and benzodiazepine, such as Librium, Valium, Xanax, Clonopin, and Halcyon, became the most widely used drugs in the world, and the most actually the most widely used drug in the world at this time was Valium. 
uh, when I was in the military, this was that was during Vietnam War. Uh, we were we were giving people um, uh, Librium and Valium uh, by the bucket load. I mean, it was ridiculous. Uh, we were getting uh, other medications in half gallon containers, uh, in gallon containers, but we. Get, we got Valium and Librium in five-gallon buckets. That's how much we were distributing to people. It was mostly the wives of, of soldiers that were overseas. Um, but we were, we were sedating people so that they wouldn't complain about what was going on, as bizarre as that is. Ergot, or barley rust, uh, had uh, created havoc wherever it appeared, and no one knew uh, why until Swiss, Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman we saw a picture of him as an older man uh, before isolated the active ingredient ly lysergic acid diethylamide from the fungus. After his discovery, Hoffman accidentally dosed himself and discovered the psychedelic effects of the substance. The U.S. Army and the CIA bought the rights to LSD from Hoffman and experimented with the drug through the 50s and into the 60s. One of the researchers working with the CIA was uh, Dr. Timothy Leary of Harvard, who decided that the psychedelic substance needed to be shared with the rest of the world. And that's how, uh, that's how LSD came to uh, be distributed uh, in the Americas. 1.5 billion people drink alcohol around the world. 76 million of these people have an alcohol abuse disorder. And I guess this guy is one of them. Uh, he's counting, I guess, one, two, there you go. Uh, pretty red face. And he's got two bottles of wine here. This Mr. Happy Man. 180 million people worldwide have used illicit drugs. 160 million people worldwide smoke marijuana each year. That is a, what do they call those things? Uh, that's a really big, a joint, really big joint, I guess. Doobie. It has been estimated that 20 to 60 percent of all hospital beds are inhabited uh, due to drug abuse, and that is really irritating for those people working in medicine. Illicit drugs figure into the economic structures both where they are grown and where they are used, heroin, cocaine, marijuana, MDMA, or ecstasy, which isn't used that much in the United States. Uh, this is really popular in Europe or was popular in Europe. A lot of these kids are now adults and they are not doing that kind of stuff anymore. And methamphetamines, of course. Uh, illegal heroin is grown in four areas of the world. Uh, the Golden Crescent is an area in Southeast Asia uh, that encompasses areas of Afghanistan, Iran, and Pakistan. And this is where illicit uh, heroin is grown with opium, of course. And that was a problem when we were in Afghanistan. We were trying to control the opium trade, the opium growing being done. All the legal op uh, opium is being is grown in uh, in India. So all of this was illicit. Uh, a lot of the economy of the area uh, is uh, based on opium. The Golden Triangle. So we have the Golden Crescent in uh, Southwest Asia. Uh, the Golden Triangle encompasses parts of uh, Southeast Asia, countries of Thailand, uh, Myanmar, uh, which used to be Burma, and Laos. This area right here is the Golden Triangle. And this was a problem during the Vietnam War. Mexico exports a form of heroin that is dark in color and called black tar or brown heroin. Colombia not only exports cocaine to the United States, but a white heroin as well. White heroin uh, found in the Golden Triangle, Golden Crescent, and Colombia is a pure, stronger heroin than that found in Mexico. So the good stuff comes from Colombia, uh, the Golden Triangle, and the Golden Crescent. 90% of the world's uh, supply of illicit heroin comes from poppy fields of Afghanistan. 60% uh, of Afghanistan's wealth comes from opium sales. And United States efforts to curb production has resulted in an increase of 50 by 50 percent. Really serious stuff. The Nationalist Chinese under Chiang Kai-shek and his Kuomintang party dealt with the drug tongs of Shanghai while they controlled China. While the Kuomintang were expelled from China, they continued to grow and market opium along the Thai-Burma border in order to buy weapons for their defense against the communists. 
So all this has to do with uh, money. It all has to do with uh, marketing. It all has to do with uh, the need to buy guns to fight your enemies. The Vietnam War was a quagmire. Not only was the war being fought in the Golden Triangle, but the United States allied itself with some of the most notorious drug smugglers in the area. And these people were the Hmong. Um, if you've ever seen the movie uh, Gran Torino uh, with uh, Clint Eastwood, uh, the, the group of Asians that he uh, uh, deals with are the Hmong, H-M-O-N-G. There are also a group called the Ho, the H-O. Uh, they were another group of uh, indigenous people in the area, uh, and we allied with them as well. The Hmong were excellent allies against the North Vietnam. Vietnamese and Viet Cong, as they moved freely through uh, Thailand, Laos, and, and Vietnam and fought the communist soldiers who encroached in their area. And for that reason, all we needed to do was give them guns. Uh, they were natural smugglers, they were natural fighters, uh, and they still are in the United States, as you saw in that movie. Uh, kind of interesting people. They'll slit your throat and smile the whole time that, the, that it's happening. Um, not that that means that, that they're dangerous now, of course, because there's no, we're not at war, certainly not at war with them. <clears throat> and we're not using them as our, uh, as our proxy soldiers. Cocaine doesn't grow just anywhere. Cocaine grows mainly in the humid mountain valleys of Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia. Cocaine has been uh, at the forefront of the political problems in Colombia for over half a century. Drug cartels operate with impunity throughout the country and control many of the decisions being made locally and nationally. Worldwide, uh, 25 million people, that's the population of Texas and Mon plus Montana, uh, have died from AIDS and another four, 40 million, that's the total populations of California and Oregon, are infected with HIV. In the United States, around 900,000 uh, people, that's the population of Montana, uh, are infected with HIV, while 500,000, the, the population of Seattle, have died of AIDS. Uh, so if all, all the people in uh, Texas and Montana uh, died, uh, that would be the number of people that have died from AIDS. When the AIDS epidemic first hit in, eight, in 1982 and 1983, it was, the most, uh, it was mostly caused by unsafe sex between homosexual males. And of course, in 1982 and 1983, I was working in the, uh, the hospital. I was working in a hospital in Omaha. Um, I was uh, running one of the lab, sections of the lab. And uh, 1982, 1983, uh, we weren't exact, we hadn't really identified yet. We were real confused as to what was going on. But in time, it spread into the intravenous drug injecting population and now is more likely to be contracted by sharing contaminated needles uh, than any other cause. Hepatitis C is a liver infection that infects 4 million uh, people in the Americas. Uh, Americans, uh, that's the total population of, actual, uh, of Los Angeles. 85 to 90 percent of all intravenous drug users are infected with, uh, with uh, hepatitis C. Uh, mostly from sharing needles. Uh, club drugs, ever since the uh, Roaring Twenties, people have been mixing the coolest of music with psychoactive uh, drugs. In the 1920s, it was jazz mixed with cocaine and bootleg liquor. Uh, women were called flappers, and men were referred to as jazz bows. And this is a flapper. Actually, she doesn't have a, really a flapper's dress on. But that's what a jazz bow looks like. And these were the cool people, the 1920s, the roaring 20s. In the 1950s, the music was the blues. The psychoactive drugs were heroin and whiskey. Uh, the men and women were either called beats or beatniks. Uh, there you go. In the 1960s and 1970s, the music became hard rock. The psychoactive drugs that fueled the music were LSD, speed, marijuana, and wine especially wine coolers. Uh, the people were hippies and the women were chicks. As we drifted into a new millennium, the music became techno or electronic trance music. 
Uh, the psychoactive drugs that fueled the craze were MDMA, marijuana, nitrous oxide, ketamine, GHB, and beer. The participants are referred to as ravers, and this is especially popular uh, over in Europe, not so much in the United States. Marijuana continues to create controversy. Legalized in uh, many states for medicinal purposes, people are required to have a prescription for its use. Marijuana continues to be the most widely used illegal drug throughout much of the, of the world, including the United States, Canada, Australia, Mexico, and South Africa. This is Amy Winehouse. Uh, she's smoking a joint. She's from England and she overdosed on alcohol. We will talk about her more. Uh, the destructive effects of tobacco have prompted many countries to try to curb its use. Uh, Cuba banned smoking in public places. Ireland has banned smoking in pubs. In many states in the, in the United States, smoking is banned in any public area. This includes Iowa, uh, Illinois, Arizona, and Montana. As late as 1966, almost half the population smoked regularly, about 42.6%. By 2005, the percentage of regular smokers in the United States had declined to less than one quarter of the adult population, 22.5%. This decline had much to do with the discovery that cigarettes contain many carcinogens that cause dis uh, disturbing medical problems. 1,178 people die every day from the effects of smoking. A study in England showed that smoking can reduce life expectancy by 10 years. And here's a picture of uh, the uh, late President Ronald Reagan uh, pushing uh, Chesterfield cigarettes. This is back in the 1950s. Now, you have to remember that I was born in 1949, so in 1966 I was a junior in high school. Uh, and in 1967 I graduated from high school. Uh, this was the right after World War II, right after the Korean War. Uh, this was at the beginning of the Vietnam War. Lots of people smoked. Uh, in our K-rations, we were given uh, cigarettes. Uh, so that was something that they gave to all the troops, were cigarettes. I used to trade mine for candy. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm real goofy. Uh, in the 1960s, if you went to somebody's house, they'd have a, an ashtray. Ashtray would be full of cigarettes. Uh, now, if somebody smokes, uh, you can smell it, and you'd want to stay out of their car and all that other stuff. In those days, you couldn't go to anybody's house where the house didn't smell like tobacco smoke, as weird as that may, may be. My parents didn't smoke, so uh, there you go. So my house didn't smell like tobacco. Uh, and maybe that has given me my sensitive sen my uh, sensitive nose, my ability to smell things. Despite the reduction of revenue for tobacco companies in the United States, they have been able to keep profits up by developing foreign markets in the third world. In the United States, tobacco manufacturers have tried to sustain their market by targeting females, minorities, and younger smokers. In 1998, uh, tobacco companies agreed to pay $246 billion over 25 years for their illicit practices in the past. And that runs out next year. Worldwide, 33 million people use amphetamines or similar stimulants, uh, sim st similar stimulant substances. In the United States, 16,000 meth labs were raided in 2004. However, meth labs have been partially controlled by controlling the precursor chemicals, ephedrine and pseudoephedrine, found in common cold remedies. And this is in 2014, there were 9,338 uh, uh, meth labs that were busted. Uh, as you can see, the state with the most meth labs in 2014 was Indiana, my home state. Uh, Missouri was second. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Illinois was third. No, that's not right. Tennessee was third. There you go. Okay, so right here was the the golden circle of, of amphetamine usage. Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Tennessee, and Kentucky right here. And Michigan, I guess. Oh, Ohio. Wow, that's quite a circle. Okay. 
Treatment for amphetamine usage has skyrocketed in the past decade. In 1993, only 21,000 people sought treatment for amphetamine addiction. This figure had increased to 151,000 by 2004. I looked for new figures, couldn't find them. Uh, other stimulants also make an impact on our lives. The use of caffeine in recent years has increased markedly. Coffee kiosks have sprung up, sprung up in tiny towns, and sales of caffeinated soft and energy drinks have exploded. 18% of teens, 4,300,000, abused Vicodin in the form of hydrocodone in 2004. Hydrocodone is the mo most widely used and abused prescription opiate. 10% uh, to 2,300,000 2, teens abuse the opi opiate uh, Percodan in the form of OxyContin, the time of release version of OxyCodone. And as you can see, uh, drugs make you look sexy. Who could argue with that face? Or that face? Or that face? There we go. Alcohol directly kills 75,000 people in the United States every year. Alcohol directly kills 1.8 million people worldwide every year. 17.6 million Americans have an alcohol abuse disorder. That is 8.5% of the adult population. Alcoholics make up 10 to 15% of people in hospitals, 10 to 20% of people in nursing homes. When MRI, MRIs were done on gamblers, the portions of the brain that were activated by winning and losing were the same area, areas that were activated by cocaine. Now, uh, surprisingly enough, if we look at uh, telephones and uh, getting messages on the telephone, same areas are, are activated and the same neurotransmitters uh, at the same intensity uh, are produced from your cell phone, as weird as that may seem. Statistics show that 2.5 million Americans are classified as pathological gamblers, 3 million Americans are classified as problem gamblers, 15 million Americans are at risk for problem gambling. One study in Minnesota in 2004 found that 1% of the gamblers accounted for 50% of the wagers. In the same year among the riverboats of Illinois, 10% of the gamblers accounted for 80% of the revenues. While gambling may be the most economically devastating uh, behavioral addiction, there are others that are equally personally devastating. Compulsive overeating, anorexia, bulimia, internet addiction, sexual addiction, excessive TV addiction, compulsive shopping, pornography addiction. These are all some of the uh, behavioral addictions, and we will talk about them eventually. There you go. So we'll talk to you next week. I, maybe not next week. Maybe the third week. Uh, we'll talk tackle chapter two. Uh, there's only ten chapters in this this textbook, so uh, there are ten lectures, and there you go.